Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Your host today is Richard Fields. Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields, and on the show we have the former uh, uh, candidate on the Libertarian Party for President of the United States, Joe Jorgensen. Welcome, Joe. Also, we have uh, yeah, we have John Cameron. Welcome, John. Uh, we need to do. It's been you know, it's been a few months since the 2020 campaign ended. And I'm sure that you've had a lot of time to reflect, Joe, on, on the campaign. So give us your reflections. What went right with the campaign? What went wrong? What do you see the Libertarian Party doing uh, in local elections between now and, and uh, 2022? What do you see happening with the uh, 2022 congressional elections? And are you running in 2024? <laughs> well, first, can I point out that is the first time I've heard myself referred to as the former candidate. So all of a sudden, I sound very old <laughs> since November. But one thing that I am very proud of is we, uh, well, first of all, we came in second, second number of votes and second highest percentage of any libertarian campaign uh, since the founding of the party. And the only uh, person who has beat us is Gary Johnson on his second run. That means that we actually beat Gary Johnson, a former two-term governor, on the first run. So that does show that our ideas are good, that we don't need to have people elected to other parties, we don't need to have big name people, that we can get the message out there if we deliver it right. Now, what I'm really proud of is that we got that number two spot by spending less per vote than any other campaign, again, in the history of the party. We spent something like $1.83 per vote, well under $2. Whereas if you look at all the other campaigns, they spent um, $2.5 all the way up to $5. And by the way, that's not uh, that doesn't take into account government caused inflation. <laughs> if you throw inflation in there, then uh, votes have cost as much as $11 a vote. So we were able to reach all those people, get all of those votes and do it for very little money. Are you running in 2024? That's too far off. But what I've been telling people is I don't think that just because you get the nomination one year that you deserve it the next time around. So I am going to be working to grow the movement. And if I can't grow the movement in the next couple of years, then I won't even run because I don't deserve to run. You're going to be at the uh, California Libertarian Convention coming up this May, right? Yes, I am. And uh, what's your message going to be to the California delegates and uh, convention goers? Well, I'm ma mainly giving a recap of the campaign and I'm going to give them numbers such as the ones that I just gave you. Uh, a few war stories from the campaign trail and uh, just talking about how we, um, for, you know, for, for the money that we had, we really did an outstanding job. And thank you to you, Richard. You were a big part of that. We really appreciate it. Well, I, I was I wrote press releases, but none of the press releases actually made it into uh, mainstream media. A lot of them got picked up by uh, local uh, outlets, but nothing nothing in the nation uh, national media. So I think you're to be complimented for doing a fantastic well, job with getting absolutely no uh, mainstream media coverage. But but Richard, had they said something outlandish, every one of them would have made it into the mainstream. So the fact that they didn't make it into the mainstream just shows how well written they were. <laughs> because well, you, you, you know, yeah. yeah, you know they will they will take anything they can get. In fact, you know, I was asked, e even though it wasn't my campaign, I was still being asked about free ponies and waffle houses. So what happens is the, the media will grab onto whatever they can to make us look silly, to make us look like we're not serious, to make it look like uh, we don't deserve to be elected. And so the fact that you put uh, reason, well-reasoned, well-informed uh, press releases out there and uh, they didn't make a mockery of them. I think that's a that's a great <laughs> a great success. No Aleppo moments. <laughs> may I may I ask a question? Um, Go ahead. The, and I don't know if you know this number, and I'd like to find it. If you don't, I'll, it'll be my research after the show. Do you know what the the uh, Republicans or Democans or whatever you want to call them? Do you know what they spent per vote? That's Any an idea? excellent question. I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure. But you know, they they get so many votes free anyway because so many people think that those are the only two parties. In fact, somebody told me that a friend of his had gone to vote for president and he you know, gets out of the voting booth and talks to his friend and said, yeah, I didn't realize there was a choice other than Trump and Biden. There was this guy, Joe Jorgensen, who's he anyway? <laughs> so, you know, there are so many people who, you know, R or D and they go in and check the box and it doesn't cost them a dime. Speaking of uh, R or D, Biden or Trump, we ended up with Biden, although uh, I haven't noticed a whole lot of difference when it comes to uh, fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, Trump was a big spender and, uh, and a huge cheerleader for monetary uh, expansion. And with uh, Biden, we're getting more of the same uh, doubled down. Uh, any, any difference that you can tell on fiscal responsibility or monetary uh, sen sensibility? Not really. And that's what a lot of our press releases said. We pointed out how Biden had a made in America. You know, he was going around talking about made in America and how we're going to give Americans more jobs. And we pointed out in press releases and on the campaign trail, hey, that sounds a lot like Donald Trump's protectionist. Uh, we've got a Biden going, uh, you know, again, bombing countries on the other side of the world inst instead of trying to make peace. It's just same old, same old. And with, re, uh, with regard to uh, censoring or uh, hobbling the internet, uh, Section 230, which is widely misunderstood, but it, what it does is it makes it impossible for uh, people to go after internet uh, platforms for what, the, for what uh, people on the platform say. In other words, uh, you know, if you're a, a Facebook uh, member or subscriber, you can say outrageous things and Facebook is not liable for what you say. Uh, Democrats and Republicans, Trump and Biden, want to take that away. Uh, do you see that voting as uh, very bad for free speech? Oh, well, you know, if you watch, if you look at um, Dorsey and uh, I know his name, <laughs> uh, uh, Facebook, if, if you look at the leaders of social media, uh, you would think that we didn't have that section because they're all acting like they're going to be held personally responsible, like somebody's going to come rouse them out of bed in the middle of the night for something that said wrong because they're out there taking people off at the drop of a hat. And I think it's really um, interesting how I've been watching the saga of Naomi Wolf, who's been a Democrat for decades. I can remember, you know, watching her 30 years ago. And they're even taking her off of these sites. So you you would think that these people um, do feel personally responsible. And you know, I've been giving this some thought because it, what they're saying is we're acting responsibly, that we don't want any, you know, we don't want to incite riots, we don't want anybody hurt. But they are using, they're they not using the same criteria that you would use in a court of law. So basically, people are having their rights. And, you know, that's another philosophical discussion to get into. But people are basically being um, quieted down, you know, they're being shut up for something that is nothing, <laughs> nothing. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Naomi Klein. Another example is uh, Matt Taibbi, the uh, Rolling Stone author, who yes. <laughs> coined the phrase uh, vampire squid, referring to, to Goldman Sachs. Uh, he has very uh, correctly, in, in any number of ways, pointed out the hypocrisy uh, on, on the part of the mainstream media. Uh, and and uh, he's being deplatformed. So is, uh, so is uh, uh, the guy that, uh, that publicized uh, Edward Snowden uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, from from the Guardian, another left wing guy. I think it's probably we're seeing more censorship of the right and, and more censorship, certainly of of uh, the Trumpists. But uh, it's 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 censorship all the way around. And the only message that we're getting out right now, or that we're hearing in mainstream or uh, widely popular or widely used sites, is a very watered down establishment. Uh, a version of what's what's actually going on in the world. Yeah, but you know, and the question is, what do you do about it? And I still vote for the free market. I still think the free market's going to be able to sort this out a lot faster than the government. You know, if you look at, for instance, the antitrust 
case against IBM, which lasted something like 13, 14 years. And they had to drop the suit because, oh, two guys out of the garage who uh, came up with Apple Computer, they were able to knock down the giant IBM much easier than the government ever did. So I still vote for the free market is doing a much better job than the government. You mentioned that Trump and Biden differed very little on uh, foreign wars, uh, defense spending. Another big uh, difference in the campaign was on immigration. Uh, the, the Democrats positioned themselves as uh, more or less pro-immigration. And of course, Trump was all about building the wall. But it's been, what, three or four months now, five, five, four or five months now since, uh, since uh, Biden has been elected and there are still children in cages on the Mexican border. More children. Yeah. Yeah, yep. more children in cages. And the, now the nice thing is I saw AOC coming out saying, hey, it doesn't matter who puts people in cages, who puts children in cages, it's still wrong. So it's at least nice that even AOC can see a little bit of the hypocrisy. Now, will anything be done about it? Probably not. Another example, of course, one that we hit hard on the campaign, or I should say you did, is, is foreign trade and the, the, the nonsensical uh, policies uh, enacted by, uh, by Trump as far as uh, tariffs on China and tariffs on everybody else in the world and uh, claiming that that's going to actually help, which of course it doesn't, but none of those have been changed as far as I can tell by the Biden administration. Oh, not at all. And, you know, this is one thing where we've got all of these classes now. We've got, um, you know, diversity classes that are required. Uh, if we're going to require anything, I think we need to require economics so that people will understand that tariffs are basically a hidden tax. And if other countries want their uh, citizens to pay for part of the goods they're selling us through taxes, great. You know, I'm all for the Chinese um, paying for part of my car or part of my washing machine or whatever it is they import over here. Why not? So uh, we, we just really need to have a more economic education in this country. We, we saw a, a huge uh, so-called stimulus or uh, COVID uh, bill under the Trump administration. Now we're seeing another one just got passed under the Biden administration. Uh, and it includes, interestingly enough, $120 billion for uh, er eradicating child poverty. The interesting thing I find about that is that it would affect 90% of kids in America. And you can, and it's, 120 billion is for one year, which is, uh, you know, figure out it's three, four hundred dollars per person that they're spending on this thing and giving away. This is a, a, a check, not a not a tax credit, a check, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, the, the fourteen hundred dollar check supposedly everybody is getting. Once something is a, a gimme, is there any way that's going to go away in the future? Oh, no, no. Once people get used to it, it, it's hard to take it away. And this is so frustrating because this is the beauty of the free market. If you try something and it doesn't work, you go bankrupt. You go out of business. Somebody else does a better job. They do it a better way. They've got a new process. Uh, they're the ones who went out and it works. What happens in government is we've got, you know, we can go back to the war on poverty. Let's go back to LBJ. Poverty was going down until they decided to have a war on poverty and then it leveled off. So we've got something that we know doesn't work and yet what, to, what does government do? They say, oh, well, um, you know, uh, what, 60 years ago we tried this and it didn't work, let's do it again. And it's been shown it doesn't work. And it's just very frustrating to see them trot out the same thing under a new name. John, this is this is your your topic. Well, yeah, go ahead. You have a question. Well, yeah, I'm I'm of the opinion, and maybe I should. I said I wanted to ask a question. Now I'm opinionating here, but I think after someone has uh, had a process in place or a program in place for sixty years or fifty years, the war on poverty, the war on drugs, the war on whatever it is, and it's failed miserably, and the opposite <laughs> effect has taken place. I don't think you can you can you can any longer can you say this is an unintended consequence. I think the only thing you can say is now this is the intended consequence. So this failed program basically 
is designed to keep people in poverty uh, and to, to uh, uh, keep them from bootstrapping themselves out. Uh, and why would, why would anybody want such a program in place? Who wins by this would be my question. Does anybody have an answer? Well, the politicians do, the people in Washington, the, the people who uh, earn their nice livings do. And mm -hmm. you bring up an excellent point. I hate that unintended consequences because they're very intended. And the, the one thing that really irks me is Obamacare because they were saying how uh, insurance was gonna go down by what, something like $2,500 a year, that it was gonna be affordable. In fact, that's what they called it, the Affordable Care Act, even though nobody knew that. I'm not sure if you saw, they, I've seen these where they do the interview with the guy on the street, right? Which, which you prefer, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act? And people didn't realize it was the same thing. And yet it made it less affordable. And then they came out and they said, oh, well, we didn't see any of this. Well, all you had to do was read any economist's uh, you know, uh, paper on it who said exactly it was going to increase costs. All you have to do is go back to the economic formulas from you know, 80 years ago to see that that's what was going to happen. Okay. Supply right. and demand find a, a price when the... Uh, supply is limited and the demand is unlimited the price goes up very very I that would, yeah i thought that would be your answer and i i wanted to i wanted to want to hear it from from a very successful uh, politician who did an amazing job in the last election getting the message out so the unintended consequences they talk about the oops it's not working let's do more of it are intended because they benefit the political class and i just like to hear it when somebody else says that Richard, yeah. you have a question uh, John, you're, you're interested in media corruption. Maybe you, I'm sorry, Joe, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say it's really frustrating. It's frustrating to people like us. We kind of look at politics as a hobby or a sports. We're engaged in it year round. But most people, uh, about three weeks before the election, they figure out who's running. And then after the election, they kind of forget about it and they don't keep up with it. They don't go back and say, oh, okay, well, they promised this, what happened? They, you know, they passed this law, what happened? Mm -hmm. And it's very frustrating to those of us who stay plugged in, who can see it so clearly. But, you know, the average person in this country just wants to live their life. They, they just want to go to, you know, go to work, have kids, go on vacation, be able to afford a car and that kind of stuff. And they just want to be left alone. And what's frustrating is they get these empty promises from politicians and they say, that sounds great. That's what I want. And mm -hmm. it's, it's the, you know, and I've had people ask me, well, why is it so hard to get your message out compared to the Democrats and Republicans? And one reason is because the Democrats and Republicans just go, oh, here, you want some money? And who's going to say no to that? Because that's a one-step process. Here's money. Yeah, yeah, you're raising your hand too. Uh, whereas we have to say, okay, here's your money, but guess what? You're going to have to pay that back in 10 years, you know, five, six, tenfold. Do you want to do that? But nobody ever gets to the second part. Yeah, we're getting $1,400 or generously uh, a couple thousand dollars and it's going to cost us, uh, what is it, $5,000 uh, in either inflation uh, in the future or in higher taxes. It's one or the other. It can't be, it's, there is no free lunch. Uh, John, I know you're interested in media corruption, and perhaps you'd like to ask Joe a question about her direct experience with media corruption, laziness, and uh, malpractice. Yeah, I, I would like to do that. And, and the most recent example that kind of drives a, dr puts another brick uh, on, on the building here of, of a completely biased and corrupt media is recently, or during the election, uh, a, a, an anonymous source uh, uh, quoted uh, a, an insider uh, stating that uh, uh, President Trump, uh, those two words together still sound weird to me, um, <laughs> had called on, on, um, on, on the, uh, a, a person in the, deeply involved in the election process in Georgia and put them on the spot and said, you need to go find the corruption. You need to go find the corruption. You need to go find the corruption. And basically said, you'll be, you know, doing the country a great favor and helping my campaign. And, da, 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 da. and this was quoted in, in, um, in the news and then republished by all the lamestream media. 
And recently, a recording of the conversation actually aired. And it turns out that what, uh, what Trump said was basically a, 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 a very clear cut message is that I believe that, that there is fraud going on in this particular part and I would like you to see if you can find it. And, and you'd be, by keeping the, I'm paraphrasing, by keeping right. the election honest, you'd be doing the American people and the nation a great favor. Two completely different messages. And yeah. once this came out, um, the, the media didn't uh, do a major mea culpa. They didn't fire all the people associated with bad journalism, which would have happened 30 years ago. Who is the famous journalist who, who, uh, uh, didn't do some background like checks. Like Dan on Rather, him. maybe? Dan Rather. Dan Rather, yeah, Dan Dan Rather. Rather lost his job. He was the yeah. voice of the American people, the most trusted man on television. And since because, Cronkite. What? Since Cronkite. Well, yeah, since Cronkite. And, and, and Brian Williams, remember? Yeah. Yeah. Talking about the, about the grenades or whatever, the flying over in the airplanes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, so, and, and, and uh, he, Dan Rather lost his job because he didn't do what any first year journalism student was taught to do, which is check your source. If it's anonymous source, uh, well, anyway, I'm rambling on. What I wanna do is ask you about your personal experience and your view about, about media corruption, because we're certainly seeing um, why anybody trusts the lamestream media after the last election and all of their lies over and over again uh, I will never know. But what? tell me about how, what you think about it and, and it, do you have some personal examples? Well, yeah, I'm just befuddled. And by the way, I am i wasn't one of these orange man bad people. And in fact, a lot of people said they first started noticing me as a candidate in the California State Convention, the debate last year, when we were asked if we would impeach Trump. And I think I was the only person who said no. And, you know, I, I think maybe I have a softer spot than most people for Trump just because I see the media twist his words. And it's like, this is what's been happening to us for decades and decades. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 you know, I kind of understand it. But here's the funniest example. So I went to Alaska to campaign. And my first stop was in Wasilla. It was in the 40s. It was just turning dark, uh, drizzly. And all I had was like a summer blazer on. And by the way, even people who lived in Alaska had on their thick coats and their hats and stuff. And I'm sitting there in just this thin little blazer giving a talk out outside, right, in the drizzling rain. I mean, we were, we were undercover, but still, it was cold. And so then the next couple of days, we went to two other cities where it was much warmer. So in one of these cities, uh, the reporter asked me, so what do you think of Alaska? And I said, oh my gosh, I love Alaska. I, I, I would move here, except it's so cold here. Well, the way they reported it, <laughs> the end of the article said, um, Jorgensen said she would love to move to Alaska if it weren't so cold. Today's temperature was 70 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like, like they, they even twist around the weather when they're going to, uh, to quote me. So, and, and, and I, I, I'm sure I made it clear to the reporter that no, I wasn't cold that day. I was cold, you know, back when it was 40 degrees out in the drizzling rain. So, yeah, you, you almost can't see anything without them uh, twisting it around. Now, we did have some good reporters who... Uh, you know, th there are some reporters who are seeing, they're looking at it as uh, journalism used to be the truth detector. They were the ones to get to the bottom. They were the ones to let the people know what's going on. And I did have my share of those reporters who really tried to give me a fair shake. But yeah, most of the reporters, they had an agenda going in and it was pretty clear. One of the uh, interesting uh, things that happened and tragic things that happened in last year's campaign was the uh, degree that racism was the uh, delineating topic. Uh, Black Lives Matter and the uh, the, the killing, the, the police killings uh, across the country and that sort of thing. Um, it's still going on. Now the, the victims seem to be, uh, if you believe the media reports, they are a massage parlor employees in Georgia. Uh, even though the uh, alleged killer 
explicitly said that his motive was not race, that his motive was something about his repressed sexuality or something. I'm not sure. Uh, it, was that, a, uh, it's, it's, it was a result of his sex addiction. Apparently. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, what's your take on, on the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, predilection of, of media and politicians to turn everything into a race issue? Oh, again, it's ridiculous. I saw, I recently saw a statistic that something like 17% uh, of marriages today in our country are interracial. And, you know, that would make sense to me because I think the average person really does try to do a good job of judging people by the con by their content and not the color of their skin. And yet the people who see race first are those who claim to want to help the problem. And so that's all they see is race. Whereas the average person is just like, you know, let, let me just live my life. I have a theory about that if I may, and I'll try to be quick, which is not like me, but I'll try. Um, I think that, that if you can get people to identify with race, I mean, it, flip the coin and, and let's say you saw a nude broadcast and it said, uh, uh, white uh, liquor store owner uh, killed by uh, black robber. Uh, is this yet another uh, example of black racism? If you tried to print that story, you would, be, it, you would be hounded to the ends of the earth, probably imprisoned for something. But uh, I think it's, it is a deliberate, not a, a massive conspiracy because these people aren't smart enough to conspire. Um, but what it is, is that if you can keep people focused on race and convince that all of their problems have to do with race, then they won't look at the problems that you've created as a government. And it's that simple. It's basically, Whoa. it's a oh. shiny object to distract people from the underlying problem of too much government. Well, not only that, but there is a race industry. And I remember having a debate with somebody decades ago, and I pointed out how if we fixed all of our racial problems, Jesse Jackson would no longer have a job. And a lot of these people would no longer have their life's mission. And so it's, it really is in their best interest to keep the problem going. One minute, what do you see that's positive on the American political scene and, and where should the Libertarian Party go from here? Well, the one thing that we need to do is just get the message out there that we are here. And, you know, it's sad I, to, to hear how so many people still didn't know they had a choice until they got to the ballot box. So we still need to get our message out and we can start by talking to friends, families, neighbors, and just get, get the word out there that you do have another choice. George Jorgensen, 2020 Libertarian Party presidential candidate. Welcome back to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Hope to talk to you again in, in two or four years. Thank you. Oh, I loved it. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint Show. In Sacramento, Channel 17 on Comcast. Each Thursday at 8 p.m. and each Monday at 5.30 p.m. for the Knuckleheads of Liberty. Also on YouTube, Facebook, and podcasts everywhere. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.